Hello, my name is Byron Powell and I'm a faculty member at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. And it's my pleasure today to, to present some of our work on implementation strategies. What I hope to accomplish this, this afternoon is to um, suggest some definitions and um, some resources that suggest the range of implementation strategies available. Um, I'd like to provide some resources for locating the evidence for implementation strategies. I'd like to suggest some potential pitfalls of applying implementation strategies and then um, also some priorities for enhancing the impact of implementation strategies and implementation strategy research moving forward. So just to start off with some basic definitions, um, we've defined implementation strategies as methods or techniques used to enhance the adoption, implementation, sustainment, and scale-up of a program or practice. And implementation strategies can be discrete or single component um, in which they involve single actions or processes such as um, uh, clinical reminders, audit and feedback, um, or clinical supervision. Um, more often than not, given the multitude of barriers that we uh, face in implementation, um, implementation strategies tend to be multifaceted in which they combine multiple discrete strategies. Um, so for example, educational workshops plus consultation um, is one example of that. Um, uh, and increasingly, we're seeing implementation strategies that are protocolized and branded. So for instance, Greg Ahrens has an intervention called the Leadership and Organizational Change Intervention, uh, which is designed to um, improve implementation and clinical outcomes uh, through the mechanism of leadership at the organizational level. Um, and this is, again, an example of um, multiple discrete strategies that have been combined into a single intervention. Just to give some examples of discrete strategies and how we expect them to operate, um, typically we hope to find a uh, nice match between the, the barriers or determinants that we're identifying um, and the implementation strategies that we're using. So for instance, if we have a lack of knowledge, um, it may be that interactive education sessions are an appropriate implementation strategy to address that. If there is a perception reality mismatch, so for instance, if clinicians are suggesting we're already using evidence-based practice, um, we may want to um, administer fidelity measures um, and, and feed them back to clinicians, oftentimes in comparison um, with their peers within or within other organizations. If there is a lack of motivation, it may be that some sort of incentive or sanction is an appropriate um, implementation strategy. And if there are challenges related to the beliefs or attitudes of, of clinicians or other um, implementation stakeholders, it may be that we use um, an implementation strategy that can uh, operate through peer influence, such as an opinion leader um, at an organization. Again, implementation strategies are often multifaceted um, and often, um, in fact, multi-level. So we're in, often in situations in which we need to think about how we combine discrete strategies uh, to address multi-level barriers. And this example provided by Brian Weiner um, in an article called In Search of Synergy that was published in the Journal um, of the National Cancer Institute, um, he suggests um, one multifaceted strategy for improving cervical cancer screening might be to um, uh, use a strategy at the organizational level, such as a learning collaborative or healthcare collaborative, um, combined with a strategy to improve provider communication at the interpersonal level. Um, and both of those strategies really are targeting physicians' motivation. Um, and those strategies might be coupled with something like education and counseling for women, um, which would um, hopefully improve women's knowledge. Um, and both physician motivation and um, women's knowledge hopefully would improve provider patient interaction um, and lead to increased uh, levels of cervical cancer screening. So a number of years ago, we actually looked to the literature to um, answer the question of what are the effective implementation strategies? Um, and what we found has, has been um, termed sort of the, the Tower of Babel problem in, in implementation science in which many of the terms that we use um, are used to describe very different, like oftentimes the same, same term will be used to describe very different strategies or different terms will be used to describe the same strategy. Um, and there's really a lot of inconsistency in the literature. Um, and so as a first step in this structured review uh, that we published in Medical Care Research and Review, we presented a um, taxonomy of 68 different implementation strategies 
um, that we grouped in these six different broad categories. So planning, educating, financing, restructuring, um, managing quality, and attending to the policy context. Um, and really what we were trying to do is just um, lay out the range of implementation strategies available um, so that as people were designing implementation strategies, they may have um, sort of a broader range of strategies to draw upon. And this was based upon a review of the health and mental health literatures. Um, we had a chance with colleagues from the VA um, to sort of refine this, this compilation of implementation strategies based upon um, expert feedback. So first through a multi-round Delphi process, um, we refined that, that um, listing of 68 implementation strategies, um, ultimately identifying 73 strategies um, that we uh, then had uh, these um, uh, experts in implementation science and practice um, group through a process called concept mapping, which is a structured sorting and rating process um, in which um, stakeholders sort these strategies into um, categories that make sense to them. To them. Um, ultimately, we, we landed on nine different um, categories of implementation strategies that you can hear on this, that you can see on this slide. Um, and I, I would just point you to additional file six of this compilation for um, what is, um, in, in this line of work, the most complete version of the compilation of implementation strategies and definitions. We hope that this uh, compilation of implementation strategies serves to identify building blocks of multi-level, multi-faceted strategies for research and practice. Um, we also certainly hope that uh, this promotes a common language and improves reporting and implementation science. Um, and finally, we hope that this actually improves um, uh, tracking or documenting implementation strategy use either prospectively or retrospectively. Um, and similarly, we hope that it can be useful in assessing fidelity to different implementation strategies. So just as we think about fidelity to public health and, and clinical interventions, um, we're increasingly thinking about fidelity to implementation strategies. And, and one way that we can improve that is by really specifying the component strategies that are used in different implementation strategies. This compilation has been um, picked up by a number of, of um, uh, federal institutes, and so we've been pleased to see this as guidance um, in NIH program announcements, um, uh, in work um, through, the, uh, through SAMHSA, uh, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, um, the National Academies, PCORI, and others. Um, and we're also seeing it extended in um, other settings such as school mental health, um, child welfare, and um, low and mental health income countries. Um, I also wanted to point out complementary resources. So uh, just as we have sort of compiled a list of implementation strategies that may be useful um, in designing and reporting implementation strategies, um, uh, these two different groups have, have compiled behavior change techniques and behavior change methods uh, that really sort of can um, specify the core ingredients of implementation strategies and other interventions in more detail. So they're definitely worth um, taking a look at. There is an increasing number of resources um, for identifying evidence for implementation strategies. And I uh, would like to point you to a few of them here. Uh, the first is the Cochrane Effective Practice and Organization of Care Group, um, which has conducted a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses of implementation strategies. So that's often a, a first stop for me as I look for evidence for implementation strategies. Um, the Campbell Collaboration, which is really a sister organization of Cochrane, has begun to um, conduct a number of um, reviews of uh, knowledge translation or implementation strategies. Um, and then finally, Health Systems Evidence, which is a site run by McMaster University in Canada, um, has done a lot of work to compile um, uh, secondary evidence on implementation strategies. So you can actually search for specific implementation strategies and this site will give you graded uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses um, uh, to provide some insights on the you know, specific strategies that you're looking at. There are a number of potential pitfalls that we often face um, when designing implementation strategies. And the first is that um, we often use this train and pray or train and hope approach in which we send people to training um, and we hope that their behavior changes. And in reality, we know that, that this is necessary but not sufficient um, to achieve the types of implementation and clinical outcomes we're looking to achieve. 
um, and that oftentimes we need more than just training. Um, conversely, um, we also fall prey to this kitchen sink approach in which um, we throw very intensive implementation strategies um, at a given implementation problem um, and, and assume that sort of more is better and that more implementation strategies given their intensity will address more barriers. Um, and in fact, we know that um, from, a, uh, from a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses that um, single component strategies um, are not always less effective than multifaceted strategies. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that multifaceted strategies um, may not necessarily um, be well matched to the types of barriers that um, uh, are evident in a given setting. Um, and so they may actually be missing the mark on some levels. Um, another plausible reason is that strategies may be multifaceted and yet still really target um, really only one level. So they may, um, uh, you may see a multifaceted strategy that really focuses primarily on provider attitudes, provider knowledge, um, things at the provider level, neglecting organizational, systemic, or um, patient level factors that may be um, driving the implementation problem. Arguably, we, we often use, um, uh, too often use a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so there's increasing emphasis in the field and how we can actually tailor our implementation strategies um, uh, at the organizational level, at the system level, um, to have a better fit between the types of barriers that we face and the types of strategies that we're using. And then finally, one of the uh, co-founding editors-in-chief of Implementation Science said that we often use the ex logiat principle, or it seemed like a good idea at the time when designing implementation strategies. So we have a long way to go to um, uh, actually make the um, selection and tailoring of implementation strategies more systematic. We recently published this paper in uh, Frontiers in Public Health in which we suggest five different um, priorities for moving forward. Um, and I'm just going to address these, these three highlighted priorities here today, um, but feel free to take a look at this paper if you'd like to read more. Uh, this is in an open access journal and so um, should be available if you'd like to see it. So one of the priorities that we think is, is critical moving forward is enhancing methods for designing and tailoring implementation strategies. Um, and this really um, comprises multiple components. First, we actually need a lot better methods for identifying and prioritizing barriers. So despite the fact that much of the early literature in implementation science has focused on identifying implementation barriers, um, and in fact, we have a number of comprehensive frameworks uh, that systematically um, uh, you know, suggest various domains that we should look at uh, when considering barriers to implementing various um, uh, clinical innovations. Um, we actually don't have a great sense of how these barriers relate to each other, how we can actually assess them pragmatically, um, and how we can prioritize the barriers that um, emerge from our um, quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods assessments. Um, second, we need um, adaptive strategies that actually address dynamic barriers. So this is the idea that even if we address um, barriers, uh, I'm sorry, assess barriers at the outset of a study or an implementation effort, these barriers are likely to change over time, and we need strategies that are going to be adaptive and can be um, sort of tailored to address those strategies over time. And finally, uh, we need systematic and rigorous methods to enhance the linkage between identified barriers and strategies. Uh, so even if we have identified and we can agree on um, a given barrier as a priority, um, we often don't have great evidence um, or theory to suggest what types of strategies should be used to address them. So we've written a bit about um, some methods that could be used to improve the selection and tailoring of implementation strategies. Don't have a lot of time to, to go into these in detail, um, but wanted to provide this as a resource. Similarly, Heather Cahoon and colleagues at the University of Toronto um, have um, suggested uh, 15 different um, papers with replicable methods for designing implementation strategies to change healthcare professionals' behavior. Um, they note uh, these four common steps, so identifying barriers, linking barriers and intervention components or implementation strategy components, um, using theory and engaging um, end users. Um, they also note there's a, a real limited focus on organizations and systems as we look at these different methods um, across the literature. 
So we've tried to address this by um, uh, linking um, our compilation of implementation strategies uh, or the, the ERIC um, strategies from the expert recommendations for implementing change project um, with a um, really widely used um, framework for uh, identifying barriers and facilitators called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research or the CIFR. Um, and so we sent um, uh, invitations to participate in a survey um, to known users of the CIFR uh, and implementation um, research and practice experts from a variety of um, from a variety of settings, um, and essentially what we presented them was a barrier according to the CIFR. So um, one domain of the CIFR is or one construct is reflecting and evaluating. So for instance, we suggested there is little to no um, quantitative or qualitative feedback about the progress and quality of implementation nor regular personal and team debriefing about progress and experience. And we asked people, select up to seven implementation strategies that might address this barrier. Um, and we had pretty, um, pretty wide range of responses. So for each barrier, I think we had something like 40 to 50 uh, implementation strategies um, suggested. And so what we did is we had level one recommendations uh, which suggested that over 50% of respondents suggested these strategies as, as plausibly addressing um, a given barrier. And then level two recommendations um, uh, occurred when we had between 20 and 50% of respondents suggesting a given barrier. So I think you can see from this slide um, that these implementation strategies are likely to, to uh, potentially address this barrier of low reflecting and evaluating. Um, and what ultimately what we developed um, through this project is a um, matching tool um, that would allow you to assess barriers using the CIFR um, and then once you've actually prioritized barriers that you think need to be addressed um, you can um, use an Excel based tool that's that's found on um, Laura's website CIFRguide.org um, to um, basically um, provide a, a range of implementation strategies that might address those barriers more specifically. Um, given the range of uh, responses that we receive, we certainly um, uh, sort of caution against um, using this tool you know, too prescriptively, uh, but we think that it might be a very useful first step as you explore potential implementation strategies in a given project. Another systematic method that we're beginning to use uh, more, and again, I don't have a lot of time to, to go into detail about this, um, is intervention mapping. Um, and Maria Fernandez and her colleagues have really done a lot of great work to advance um, the use of intervention mapping in implementation science. Uh, we're currently using it in a couple of, of projects funded by NIMH uh, and NIDA. Um, and Maria and her colleagues have recently published a paper in Frontiers where she really explicitly makes connections between intervention mapping and implementation science. In fact, sort of um, uh, redubbing uh, this as implementation mapping. Um, and this is a great place to start if you're interested in another systematic method that can be used to um, develop and uh, potentially tailor implementation strategies. Another real important um, priority um, in the field is really to, to start focusing not on whether or not implementation strategies work but really how and why they, they work. So there's an increasing focus on specifying mechanisms or processes or events through which an implementation strategy operates to affect desired implementation outcomes. Um, Kara Lewis recently led a paper um, here that was published in Frontiers in Public Health um, where we talk about the use of causal pathway diagrams. Uh, so in this example that you see here on the right, um, we're looking at an implementation strategy to increase the use of uh, measurement-based care for depression. Um, so we might have a strategy such as uh, a financial disincentive for missing a PHQ-9, um, which really ultimately might be operating through the mechanism of, of increasing motivation. Um, but you can see here there are a number of uh, moderators at the cognitive and the organizational level, um, and there are some, some preconditions which essentially are um, moderators which are so strong as to, to, to qualify as preconditions for change. Um, and the idea here is that we want to um, document the pathway by which this implementation strategy works, 
Um, and, and more importantly, we want to start to identify and measure what those mechanisms are. So in this case, we want to explicitly be measuring whether um, a financial disincentive for missing a PHQ-9 actually improves clinician motivation to use um, measurement-based care for depression. To provide some other examples, um, if we have a determinant related to provider knowledge, we may use education and, and more specifically the provision of information, uh, again, which might operate through the mechanism of awareness building or knowledge acquisition. If we have uh, an implementation outcome related to, um, I'm sorry, an implication implementation determinant related to provider um, skill, we may use training uh, and more specifically teaching and practice with corrective feedback, which may um, operate through the mechanism of skill acquisition, uh, refinement, and mastery, um, and so on and so forth. The idea here is that we want to be specifically um, identifying and measuring these mechanisms of change uh, to really understand how and why implementation strategies work so that if they don't work, we can actually do something to um, uh, tweak and refine the implementation strategies. And if they do work, we really understand the mechanisms by which they work and how we might replicate that uh, in other settings. We have an opportunity to develop a mechanisms-focused research agenda um, through an AHRQ conference grant that is um, uh, being run concurrently with the Society for Implementation Research Collaboration Conference, which is a biennial con conference um, that's been held in Seattle for the last um, uh, 10 years. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities to get involved in this agenda if you're interested, so please uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me or the PI, Kara Lewis, um, if you'd like to get more involved in uh, this effort. And then finally, a real challenge for implementation strategy research is um, the poor description, uh, tracking, and reporting of implementation strategies. Uh, this ultimately limits replication in science and practice. Uh, we don't necessarily know what people did, and so we can't replicate that in any way. Um, and ultimately, it precludes answers to how and why strategies work, or um, this piece about identifying mechanisms, as I was just talking about. This is just one example from a uh, review in Millbank Quarterly from Aram Nadim and colleagues, where they were looking at learning collaborative, collaboratives or quality improvement collaboratives, and they noted that reporting on specific components of uh, learning collaboratives was imprecise across articles, rendering it impossible to identify active ingredients linked to improved care. Um, and so we've called uh, upon the field to um, specifically name, define, and um, specify implementation strategies. Um, and specifically, um, we'd like for people to um, really suggest who are the actors involved in implementation strategies that are actually enacting the strategy? What specific actions are, there are they taking? What is the action target? Or we might actually um, uh, rename this as what is the mechanism by which this implementation strategy is working? Are there issues related to temporality or sequencing of the strategy? So for some multifaceted strategies, for instance, we may need to um, increase provider motivation before we send them to training. Um, and so any documentation of, of timing or sequencing of implementation strategy that is important is really critical to, to specify. What is the dose of the implementation strategy? What implementation outcomes do we think are likely to be affected? And then finally, what is the empirical, theoretical, or pragmatic justification for the choice of implementation strategies? As an applied example, uh, my colleague Alicia Bunger uh, wrote this paper several years ago um, in which we took a learning collaborative that was focused on implementing trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and this learning collaborative had 11 components, or you might think of them as discrete implementation strategies uh, within it. Um, and in that paper, Alicia um, specified each of those 11 components um, according to the, the Proctor et al. standards that I just presented on the previous slide. Um, and ultimately, I think this makes it um, easier for someone if they wanted to actually replicate this strategy um, or if they wanted to see you know, why it was effective or why it wasn't effective, uh, they, would, they would clearly be able to tweak different components, um, having a, a greater understanding of um, their details uh, based upon this reporting 
There are a number of other um, reporting guidelines that are, um, I think, important to be aware of. Uh, one is the Standards for Reporting Implementation Studies, or the STARI statement, um, which really presents sort of from, from title and abstract um, on through conclusions of a paper, what are the important elements of an implementation study that you want to um, specify. Um, and then two more that are really more focused on interventions or implementation strategies um, are the Tidier Checklist um, and the AIMED Framework, developed by Heather Cahoon, Peter Bragg, and colleagues. Thank you for your time, and, and uh, please feel free to contact me if you have questions about any of these um, uh, resources that I'm providing. Um, hopefully, uh, they're helpful, and hopefully, um, we can be in touch in the future. Thank you.